is an interview at the New York State Military Museum, Saratoga Springs, New York. It is the 4th of January, 2005, approximately 1 p.m. Interviewers are Wayne Clark and Mike Russert. Could you give me your full name, date of birth, and place of birth, please? Yeah, Robert A. Addison. I was born in Akron, Ohio on December 7th, 1922. Okay. Um, <clears throat> what was your your educational background prior to entering service? Well, I graduated from high school preceding January, January of 41, and I had started at Mount Union College, which was in my hometown of Alliance, Ohio, and uh, in November I got appendicitis, and back in those days they keep you in the hospital for a couple of weeks, mm -hmm. and, then ups, and then as I was recuperating uh, on my birthday, December 7th, 1941, some of the fellows were in and we were you know, just batting the breeze and my younger sister came home from the movie and said they stopped the movie and announced that they bombed Pearl Harbor. And uh, so that's where I was in the process of in, in college and uh, uh, so. Do you remember your reaction and the reaction of those that were with you when they heard that? <clears throat> oh yeah. It was, <coughs> Everybody was pretty shocked, you know, and uh, of course, didn't, I didn't realize it till I was down uh, with downtown, the next, you know, in a malt shop, you know. I said, oh, son of a gun, that was my birthday, you know. <laughs> <laughs> so I had a personal vendetta against them, I guess. And uh, was the whole town buzzing about it? Oh yeah, 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 yeah different. Reaction. Some of the fellas, oh, this is going to take six weeks, you know. They got little 22 rifles. Well, they had 25s, but mm -hmm. 25s were a lot more powerful than 22s, we found out. And, uh, but, uh, but us, the fellas, and then so I said, well, I played football, basketball, baseball all the way through school, and so football out there is big stuff, you don't know if you're. Uh, that's where Paul Brown got his start in mm -hmm. Massillon. I played against these high school teams, and I'd like to be part of the best of the best or something. And so well, I heard the Marine Corps pretty good guys, so I went down and asked them. I said, "How long after appendicitis will you take me?" He says, "Well, how long has it been?" I said, "Well, six weeks. Any time." Oh, so I went home, and I have my mother says, "What do you say? Take any time?" No, like hell, you know, you're gonna wait till after the holidays. So. So January 7th, then I went down and I left for the Marine Corps on January 7th. So you picked the Marines because you felt that they were the best yep. organization? <clears throat> Where did you go for your training? Well, we went to Paris Island. Mm -hmm. Now, of course, all the Marine, I guess they had just a skeleton first, two, two, skeleton of two divisions, very, very basic. And uh, so they had, they, they were bringing them in 500 a day mm -hmm. down to Paris Island. And they had cut boot camp from 13 weeks to six weeks. So they what they usually did would have two weeks of close order drill, and then they'd send you the rifle range for three weeks and back for close, you know, a week of extended order drill, and you were through. Well, when it came time for us to go to the rifle range, it was a room, because we are you know, coming in 500 a day. So they put 500s on a train and shipped us up to Quantico. Now this is the latter part of January, the first part of February. I don't know, Quantico is in Virginia, but it still gets cold and mm -hmm. rainy and, and uh, it was miserable on that rifle range. In fact, I think it was the only time during record day that the Marine Corps called off record because the targets were flying out of the wrecks. They were so windy. And uh, anyway, and... Uh, how, so was the, how was the training? Was it pretty tough, that six weeks? Well. A lot of the guys who, we had a lot of guys from New York City, and it was very rough on them, but mm -hmm. I found it wasn't as tough as high school football in Ohio. You know? <laughs> so I didn't now, have any uh, what kind of guns were you using at the time? The O3s? We had the O3s, and we took the O3s all the way through Guadalcanal. You did? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Now, when you first went in basic training, did you have the old World War I helmets and so no, on? No, we just had those old pith helmets you know, oh, at okay. the time. Uh -huh. And uh, I never got one of those. They were in the process of changing over. And so, and uh, now the, the Raiders were forming in, in uh, Quantico at the time. They, the old, they were the old 1st Battalion of the 5th Marines. And uh, 
they'd been pulling maneuvers up and down the, the East Coast, and they were stationed there. And so they pulled them out of the 5th Regiment, and they were going to make it what they called the 1st Separate Battalion. But then they decided to go with the name Raiders. Mm -hmm. and, uh, now, did you have to volunteer for this, or were you picked? Yes, this was another volunteer. Volunteer? They came out. We were just about to finish boot camp, and they came out, so we got this outfit, told us what kind of an outfit it was, and they took us into a barracks and interviewed us, and then they picked the ones, and then so here was a, just a, you know, a crop of fresh guys. To, so that's how they built up the battalion from these guys just finishing boot camp right there in Quantico. How many guys volunteered out of your group? I, I don't know. I, I don't recall. But uh, Was there quite a few? Or? Well, quite a few, yeah. There mm -hmm. were quite a few. See, we had, what, 60-some 60, 60 in the platoon. And I, I, I would judge 30, 40 of us mm -hmm. volunteered. And they took most of us. Some of them they didn't. I don't know why. They picked me, though. I, I got a feeling one of the reasons they picked me is because of my high school football, you know. Mm -hmm. They knew football back and then. Uh, the fellow that interviewed me was Major uh, Captain Bailey at the time, and he'd been a pro football player, and, and uh, so and then so he was picked. I don't, I don't, one fellow in, the, in my boot camp platoon, they didn't pick, I don't know why, but uh, uh, it just, this fellow just wasn't the type they wanted. Mm -hmm. And uh, so... And the battalion still wasn't built up, and that was my graduation from boot camp, marching from the rifle range into the A barracks in Quantico, and that was it. Mm -hmm. So then we became right in the, in the uh, Edson's Raider, it was called just the 1st Marine Raider Battalion at mm -hmm. that time, and that was, oh, about the middle of 17th, 18th of, of, uh, of February. And then we went into real, then, when, then we went to real stiff training then. After Where that. did you go? Did you stay there? Right there in Quantico, yeah. right there in Quantico, yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, it, where we pull maneuvers and everything's all built up now, you know, and uh, I don't think they have, they have infantry type people there at this point. And uh, so they, uh, they kept doing it. And then uh, in April, now, now we, uh, we had an, an oversized battalion. Most of the battalions were about 750 men. And they had three rifle companies, a weapons company, and a headquarters company. Well, we had four rifle companies, so we were close to 900 men. And uh, one rifle company, D Company, was not fully developed yet. And in the meantime, I was put into 81 millimeter mortars. But then they decided, no, we're going to do away with those. Those are too big, too big to carry. You know, your base plate weighs about uh -huh. 80 pounds. Mm -hmm. And a good thing it did, because we could never have gotten it through some of the places we had to go through. And uh, so then there, we were there. And in April, the company's headquarters, most of the headquarters company in A, B, C, and E company, which is what I had been in with the mortars, they chugged off for San Diego and eventually went to Samoa for two months. And we were back in Quantico waiting for this other rifle company to fully develop. So they didn't know what to do with us. You know, so they well, let's send them to demolition school. So we took a six-week course in ten days. You know, and uh, so I went. I went overseas, and in June, we went over, and, and uh, I went overseas as a demolition person. We stopped at Samoa, picked up our our, our our battalion, went on to New Caledonia. Well, we got there. They already had most of their demolition people they needed, so they threw me back into E Company in 60 millimeter borders. And, and uh, so that's the way I went into, finished up, I was 60 millimeter borders mm -hmm. all the way through. Mm -hmm. And then we finally got word, and now we traveled on APDs. I don't know if you know, those are the old World War I four stack destroyers. And they had put new diesel motors in them, and they, so there was a room, there was room for a company of troops in these APDs, and that's what they'd pulled maneuvers on prior to the war up and down the coast. So they were attached to our battalion. We didn't go overseas in those. We went overseas in a, in a big uh, transport. Uh -huh. We got the New Caledonia. There four of them were there, and we pulled some more maneuvers there, and then shoved off, went up to the Fijis. Well, here I am one day up on a ridge. There they go again. I'm left behind again. And uh, but they just didn't have room in those four destroyers. For, for all of us, and so there was a, 
there was a, a New Zealand, and it had been a, somewhat of a luxury liner, you know, one of these liners where they had dance halls and all that, but they had put a few four, eight, six inch guns on it and called it a cruiser <laughs> from, New, from Manawai was his name. And uh, they went down, he just brought a load of mutton from New Zealand up to New Caledonia. So they went down and approached him. Yeah, I'll take you up, sure. So the rest of us filed aboard there and went up up to the Fijis. And he wanted to go all the way. No, you go home back. So they put us on transports who were filled up all the time. So at the time, they were complete. So we were just sleep up on deck. And we pulled a few maneuvers there. Then, August 7th, we hit the island of Tulagi. And uh, I think the reason they chose us to do that because our fellows were in pretty good shape because they'd been in Samoa a couple of months. The rest of the division had just gone to New Zealand to Australia, and they they were in any kind of, any kind of a shape. But but the reason we had to go into Guadalcanal was they found out that they were building this airstrip on Guadalcanal, uh -huh. and uh, you know and prior to that the Japs had lost four aircraft carriers to Battle of Midway, so they had to get other means, in other words, to, to work, you know so they could bomb or you know take off. Place where they could base planes to go to Australia, New Zealand, New Caledonia, Samoa, whatever. And so they were building this airstrip, and so we had to get it back. And so on the 7th of August, we, uh, 8 o'clock, as this thing here says, we were the first offensive brown troops to engage. Why don't you hold that up in front of you, Wayne, to <coughs> focus on that? Yeah, we were the first offensive brown troops to engage the Japanese because we went into Lagi at 8 o'clock. The rest of the division went in Guadalcanal at 9 o'clock. Mm -hmm. Now that's the insignia you wore? Mm -hmm. That's the insignia? Yeah, this is, this is our <laughs> insignia. Mm -hmm. yeah. What rank were you at that time? I was just a private. I was just, just a, you know, that, back in those days you didn't make PSC out of boot camp. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I was just a private. Okay. okay. And uh, so, uh, anyway, we, we they, they decided we would take the island of Tulagi, and they had no problem taking the airstrip on Guadalcanal because there were very few tro troops there. They were mm -hmm. mainly Korean workers working on the airstrip, so they didn't have any problems taking the uh, taking the airstrip itself. We had a, quite a battle over on Tulagi because. Now, how did you land? What kind of? Did you use the old Higgins boat? The old Higgins boats were even mm -hmm. over the over sides, the sides. And, and we couldn't get within a hundred yards of the beach because of the coral. Mm -hmm. And so we had to wade in. Fortunately, it was not a defended beach. And uh, we were anywhere from our knees to our, up to here, uh, you know, in the water, depending on the coral and all that stuff. Because the boats couldn't go, it would have ripped the bottom. They were just wooden. Mm -hmm. You know, the old Higgins boats were just wooden boats, no ramps. And uh, that's the way we've been in. And, uh, Can I ask you a second? Um, I think, wasn't your unit, they were the first, one of the first to use the, uh, the two piece? Camouflage uniforms? Is that what you had? What what kind of uniform did you no, wear? No, in? not not at that point. We not still had the yet. old old green. Oh, okay. Everybody still had the old green. Uh -huh. no, they didn't come out to the camouflage until we went to New Cal New Georgia. Oh, okay. And then we had those. Yeah. All right. And uh, so instead of those camouflage things on the helmets, we had a hunk of burlap painted green on our helmets. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and uh, so you had the old herringbone type fatigues, but that uh, like an OD type fatigue you wore. Yeah, it was just a, almost a solid color, mm -hmm. olive drab, you know, and uh, just had insignia and real marines mm -hmm. on it. That was it, that was okay. dark green. That, that was it. Yeah, and uh, and no, it, no, 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 no rank was on. I, I, I it's amazing. These, I see all these officers and non-coms with ranks out there in combat. And ours no, had no combat. No, of course, the Japs would pick them off first. You know. Sure. And another thing they would pick off first would be corpsmen. Mm -hmm. See, of course, the Marines didn't have any medical things, so the Navy supplied corpsmen and doctors. And according to the Geneva Convention, they were supposed to wear a Red Cross band, no arms, one day. That was it. Mm -hmm. Off came these, and on went the arms, because the Japs were picking them off first, so they couldn't treat anybody. And, uh, but uh, Tulagi was where the governor of the Solomon Islands, British all the Solomon Islands lived prior to the war. And it was a beautiful little island, about a half mile wide, three miles long, and had a polo ground and all, all this kind of stuff. And, uh, and it had a lot of houses on it. And uh, so we finally 
and a lot of caves. So he had a lot of caves, and so we we went down. We we couldn't use our mortars for after the first day because we thought we had them in such a small area that they could. But then we found out we had bypassed a lot of them. We were still in the caves, and then they came out at night. Then that's when all hell broke loose, you know, and stuff. That's when we got a lot a lot of our casualties were that night too, and. Uh, so in about three days, three or four days, we, we finally had it all secured, and and, uh, and we stayed there, and then we went on patrols over to Florida Island, which is right there, but there's nothing over there. And in the meantime, the Japs had tried to take back the, the, the airstrip in the Battle of Teneru with a thousand men, and, uh, and the Marines just stuck them into a trap and annihilated them. And uh, now if they'd have waited, it, and then, so then we went over towards the end of the month, and they knew that the Japs, see, all we had was just a little perimeter, I don't know if you can tell oh, yes. yeah, can, can focus on that. On that, where this little square is, right down here, There's a little square down here, where is it here, that's all we had of Guadalcanal. Just a perimeter defense around the, the airstrip, and the Japs could land any place. Bailey, because better back up a little bit here. And August 9th, two days after we'd gone in, there was a sea battle out near Savo Island. Mm -hmm. We lost four cruisers that night, and so our fleet took off. Went back to New Caledonia. Our transports went back half. Half our supplies went back with them, and everything. So there we were, all by our lonesome. How did you feel about that? Well, I don't know. I was always an optimist. I don't know why. Mm -hmm. and people tried to tell me how, tell us how bad it was, but I thought ah, they were. Until later on, I found out that they were, they were wrong. It was worse than they were telling us. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and in fact, in a, one of the new, newest books that came out, they said we were known as... Uh, the, the Maroon Division, mm -hmm. because we were just there. And they I know we interviewed a Marine that's called the Starvation Island. Did you have uh, short rations and? Oh yeah, we took rations for about 72 hours, you know, or, or you know, about three mm -hmm. days. But our colonel, he says, hey, the Japs are eating, so, so that's what we did on, on Tulagi. We ate what, what, you know, rice, their Japanese rice and all this mm -hmm. stuff, and we were down to about one meal a day, and. Uh, so until they finally got things back into us, but it was quite a while. See, we had no air support. Uh -huh. They could bomb us. They could shell us. And uh, have a, see, people ask, well, what, what made your battalion so much better than the others? And I said, well, it was training and leadership. We had terrific leadership. And uh, this Colonel Edson, while we were in, in Quantico, he'd go out, we'd go out on, on a Saturday morning, take a 22-mile hike, you know, and he would stop every once in a while and watch everybody go by. And then he'd double time up the top and take off. And when we came back, got into the, into the barracks, he was there talking. He would make com you know, nice remarks to everybody, complimentary remarks to everybody as they came in. And that's the type of a fellow you, you know, you're going to go with. So you had a lot of respect for him oh, as a leader? Yeah, yeah, a lot of respect. Oh, Colonel Edson, he was... Did you have that much personal contact with him? Was I did that? not, no. Oh. No. And... Uh, so, but it, it, uh, so that that was two things that, uh, and not only leadership, but the leadership they developed in us, because most a lot a lot of guys who after the war went on, and hey, I was myself, you know, I retired as a full professor from a college, and I, I felt that's probably equivalent to a colonel in the Marine Corps or something mm -hmm. anyway, you know, and, and and a lot of guys went into got into you know. Uh, Developed leadership roles after. Well, in fact, four of our we have four uh, received the Congressional Medal of Honor. We had uh, eight of them. Eight, eight of our battalion members became generals, and I got a list in there of all, all the other you know it's the Navy crosses, Silver Stars. Mm -hmm. 24 Navy ships are named after fellows from our one battalion, which is, uh, I don't think there's any other battalion, one battalion. They keep telling me, you know, it's probably the outstanding battalion the Marine Corps ever had. And, uh, 
when we go back for our reunions in Quantico, they they, they treat us all. Oh, they just, you know, it's, it's fantastic. And of course, we're smaller and smaller. Last time, I think we only had about 25 of us there. We're losing 15, 20 guys every year. And uh, we, we, somebody said, well, how many how many are alive? We, we, we don't know. Uh, in, you see, we're in existence two years, and in a two-year period, 2,600 guys went through the battalion, you know, replacements and so forth. Mm -hmm. Well, anyway, let's go back. We, <laughs> I, I just have one question I want yeah. to ask you. Did you have any specialized equipment that the other Marines didn't have? I, know, I heard that... Uh, the Raiders were issued a special type uh, dagger or knife they yeah, carried? Yeah, we, we had stiletto's. Uh-huh. That's why the only we had, just the stiletto's, that's all. But the rest of your equipment you, was... Everything was... I also thing. read that you had a, some British or Canadian guns with you, specialized guns, or you, you didn't? No, not the... Mm -hmm. I, I wasn't aware of them. Yeah, okay. Yeah. But you did carry the O3 basically through the, the entire Guadalcanal campaign? Guadalcanal. When the 7th Marines came on in October, I think they were the first ones to bring on the M1. Uh -huh. Did you yeah. like the M1 or did you prefer the O3? I never had an M1. <laughs> or I mean, you, okay. Uh, well, the reason I never had an M1 was because I left the island with the O3s. And then when we, uh, well, we, after we, uh, we went down to New Zealand for some liberty and then came back to New Caledonia. New Caledonia was kind of our base. Uh -huh. And then we got in replacements. And then they decided to do away with the weapons company. So they sent two machine guns and a mortar to each weapon, uh, to each rifle company. They already had two machine guns and mortars. So that gave each rifle company four machine guns and three mortars. And so I was a gunner at the time on this squad, and uh, the first squad, we went down to A Company. When we got down to A Company, they needed a squad leader for their second squad, so I went over and took over the second squad and my weapon then was a carbine. Mm -hmm. So they were just a couple months off the, out of the factory. What did you think of the carbine? It was nice, nice. Because we, we didn't have to fire. We couldn't, we, you couldn't see 100 yards a lot of times. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you were, you know, and uh, so it was in for, you know, it was light, and you, I think they had about 20 rounds or so. And, uh, and uh, so, so anyway, we go back. Let's go back to Guadalcanal here when, okay. when, we, uh, <laughs> when we went over. I say they, we just had that perimeter defense around. Now, down the beach, they flew that the Japs had been landing down a place called Tassimboko. And uh, so, and this uh, Colonel Edson, he had been in China prior to the war, and he knew, he knew what the Japs were going to do before they knew what they were going to do, really. And uh, so he, uh, he, he knew it was trouble if we didn't get down and do something with that where they were landing. So they sent us down to raid this, uh, this village down there at Tassimboko. And when we got down there, uh, the main body had already pushed off into the jungles. And they had four pieces of artillery there, which if we hadn't have destroyed it, they would have used it on us on the Battle of Bloody Ridge. And so we destroyed them, pulled them out to sea, blew up their ammunition dump, destroyed what chow we couldn't push in our pockets while we destroyed. And, uh, and they had everything. They had bicycles and everything there. And so then we came back, and there was a gap in the defense around Henderson Airfield on this Lunga Ridge. And Edson just knew that this is where they were going to attack. And... Uh, and it took a while for him to convince General Vandegrift for us to go out and put up our defense around there. And still then, we were spread out quite a bit, too. And uh, so on September 12th and 13th, that's when they attacked us. And there were 700 of us, about 3,500 of the Japs. And what helped save us was the 11th Marines artillery. We had... Uh, our forward observer, right up there by Edson. I, I could hear them all night long. And they were dropping them just 100 yards ahead of us. When you hear these things coming in, you swear they're going to drop in on you. But they kept them scattered enough so that we could, uh, you know, that not too many could hit us at once. But it was a, it was a two, between a two and three days. They bombed us and everything the night before, shelled us. And they knew right where we were. Mm -hmm. And uh, so... Uh, 
then after that morning, why we pulled off and the fifth Marines took off, the Japs took off in, and, and they left. Oh, and I got pictures of what they'd left on. Uh, it, it is uh, it's estimates of anywhere from 800 to 1400 that they left on the, on, on Bloody Ridge. There was grass like this the night before, and the next day you could hardly see a blade of grass. So they just kept choom, bonsai, 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 you know. And they, they wouldn't. Yeah, another thing, when I came back overseas, people asked me, what's the difference between the American servicemen and the Japanese? And I said, well, and I think the Germans the same way. We were taught to think for ourselves. And, uh, but they were just, they did just follow orders, Bandai, you know. And uh, if they would have probed, they would have found that we didn't have anything to our left. They could have served around and, and surrounded, but they just had head on, head on, head on. And uh, I, I think on D-Day, I think you've probably looked back, you've probably seen a lot of those things, where there were cases where American junior officers, NCOs, made uh, decisions, uh -huh. important decisions. But yet there was a German general in, 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 in tanks. He knew what he had to do, but he couldn't do it because he didn't get orders from above. Mm -hmm. and Patton, or not Patton, Rommel was off at a birthday party to his wife, and Hitler was asleep, and nobody dared to wake him up. Mm -hmm. And the guy couldn't get any orders to do it. So as a result, he couldn't do what he knew he had to do. But yet there were, as you've probably heard, many, many cases of junior officers and NCOs making decisions on the spot. And we were, we, we, we had that. We, we could make decisions on the spot. And uh, in fact, uh, that last uh, morning on the ridge, the Jap, we were behind one little ridge and there was a, a, a Jap uh, <coughs> a machine gun had come up. And somebody up ahead of us in the headquarters said, hey, can you get 150 yards on that pea shooter? Yeah, okay. So he rode, held, held up a gun. We sighted in on that. He says, well, go 10 mils right, 10 mils. That, that was it. So we, and then there was a down, and there was a jungle down in here off this ridge. And they were in there, and they had the range of the, of the ridge with their mortars, knee mortars, and machine guns. And they were picking them off, picking us off. In fact, I don't know, I was up there, and all of a sudden I looked up, and here comes one right at me. Just happened to lip beside me and rolled down the hill, never went off. <laughs> but anyway, we pattern fired our mortars down in that area. You know, we'd get one, and we'd go 10 mils right. 10 mils right, up 25 yards, 10 mils left, 10 mils left, do one and move on. And we did that. We, we must have thrown in 100, over 100 rounds in there. We silenced the whole crew. So that's where our little 60 millimeter mortars, and they didn't, nobody teased us about our pea shooters anymore, you know. So we, and uh, so we came off, and we, we, we had about, I, I don't know, close to 50% casualties that night. Or the, those two nights. Did you ever? Did you have any hand-to-hand -hand fighting yourself, or anyone? Hand-to-hand -hand fighting yourself. Myself, no, I did not. Mm -hmm. I, uh, of course, I was just where I was. I was where I was supposed to be, when mm -hmm. I was supposed to be there, doing what I was supposed to do. And uh, I guess I just happened to be there. I was in the mortars, and and I, that's what we were called on to do. What we did there, and uh, so so when we came off, then we went back in the coconut grove. And in the meantime, Edson, he had made full colonel. See, and a battalion has a lieutenant colonel. Uh -huh. So he, uh, Van de Griff relieved the commander of the 5th Regiment and made Edson the commander of the 5th Regiment. And so up the other way, I put the Montana on the other side, went up at the Montana cow, the Japs had come in that way too. And, uh, and that's where the 5th Regiment was. And so we were back in the, in the, uh, well, we'd gone up a couple of times to to uh, try to circle around them and everything, but we uh, we were unsuccessful because they were just well, what do we have 60 millimeter mortars. That's all we have, and uh, so so we came back and they says, all right, now you're going to be the reserves of the reserves. In fact, it, the only time they'll call on you if the island is in danger of being retaken. So one morning. You see an A and C company back in their gear. Where are they going? Well, they're going up to guard Edson CP. Oh, okay. 
next morning, get your gear ready. Where are we going? Well, they had to use A and C Company last night, so we're going up to Garvin, <laughs> CP. And uh, so, fortunately, that's all we did do. But that night, there was a lot of skirmishing going on, and some Japs had come on our side of the Matanikau River, and they were trying to get back before the tide came in, so they could wade through. And they ran into our A Company mortars who were dug it digging in. And they were skirmishing, and Edson thought they were trying to come this way, but they were trying to, and he was yelling at them, screaming, you got a hold, you got a hold. And we went up the next day, and we pulled eight of our fellows and about 60 Japanese, all hand to hand, not a shot fire. And, it was, and this was four days before we had to leave the island. <laughs> And uh, these poor guys got it that one night, you know. And uh, so, so anyway, then when the army came in, all right, they kept brought in 3,000 army from New Caledonia. They'd been sitting down there, and and uh, I don't know for some reason the Navy wanted this an all Navy Marine show. I don't know why, mm -hmm. but they finally brought up this uh, division of army from New, Cal New Caledonia, and that's what we left on. And uh, so. Uh, those transports. And in fact, we left a little early because we had these character called Pistol Pete. He was a piece of artillery up in the up in the hills, and he would shell us. When they would bomb, they would he would drop some shells, and we got to think, hey, that, there's a different sound between a bomb and a, and a uh -huh. shell. No, and then we figured out that he was shelling the same time they were dropping bombs on us. Well, he started to shoot the ships, and a couple of rounds went through the rigging on the, on the ship, and the old captain of the ship, hoist anchor and get out of here. In fact, he left some of his Higgins boats there. And uh, so we went back. And to show you the difference uh, between, again, between our, you know, the American servicemen and theirs, uh, when we got aboard ship, there were some prisoners aboard there. There, were, there had been Japanese sailors who had been picked up. I don't know where this ship picked them up or somebody else picked them up and moved them to this ship to take them back. And they had sheets, blankets, pillow pillowcases. We had bare mattresses <laughs> to sleep on. But that's how they treated us. But the way the Japs treated guys in the, in the uh, water, they would run them over with their destroyers and machine gun, you know, survivors in them, and that, that, that again was a little difference, and that kind of irritated us, because of some of them were these APDs that, they, that, that, that got sunk, who were very, very good friends of ours, you know. Uh -huh. And uh, in fact, when we went from Tulagi to Guadalcanal, we were on this Calhoun, and it was the late afternoon, and they said, uh, well, they were debating whether to take us ashore or leave us and take us ashore in the next morning. Well, let's take them ashore. We hadn't even hit the beach yet, and the ship was gone. They had a bombing, and then the ship went down in three minutes. You know, so there was another close call. You know, just and uh, and by the time we left there, all of those APDs had been sunk. You know, and uh, so and as you look on this chart, the Navy lost a lot more men mm -hmm. on Guadalcanal than, than than the Marines did because of all the sea battles that were. I don't know if you have ever heard uh -huh. of it. Iron Bottom Sound. You yes. know? All the ships are down there. That big book I have here has pictures of all mm -hmm. these ships that are down at the bottom of that uh, Iron Bottom Sound. And uh, so then we went back back to New Caledonia. And you know, a ship was going down in the dry dock, going down to Wellington, New Zealand. And they said, OK, as long as it stays, you can stay. Well, we were aboard ship on Thanksgiving going down. And they had supposedly a nice Thanksgiving turkey dinner, but they ran out, and I got cold cuts. But it was still better than what I'd been getting on the water canal. <laughs> and uh, so then we got down there right after Thanksgiving, and we spent Christmas and New Year's. And, and then uh, it was one of the finest Christmases I ever spent. And uh, we board, go aboard. We had a, you know, all we had to do was come back and check in at 8 o'clock in the morning. That's all we had to do every <laughs> morning. A lot of guys got hotel. Right? Hey, I got a bunk. I'm not going to pay a bunk. So I'd come back to the ship, and and uh, the day before Thanksgiving, I said, "Well, maybe I'll go to the Y and get a bunk." You know, and they, in their gymnasium, they'd put up double double deckers, and and uh, so I got a bunk for three nights, 
and breakfast, and it cost me two and six. Forty cents a night <laughs> and breakfast. And uh, as I was coming out, some old elderly lady stopped me and said, you got a place to eat Christmas dinner tomorrow? I says, no. She says, well, come up to my place. And she told me where she lived. If you got any friends looking for places, so I asked, no, I couldn't find anybody, so I called her, well, come on up. I live at 12 Apuka Street, A-P-U-K-A. -A. I still remember that. Way up in the Brooklyn section of Wellington, New Zealand. And I climbed, and the streetcars weren't running after Christmas Day, so I walked up there. And she had a couple more American sailors, a couple of New Zealand sailors, and her nephew, her uh, grandson, who was later in the New Zealand Air Force. And, uh, and a nice, that was my first experience with plum pudding. And I ate it and all of something hit, oh wow, a piece of coin or something. And then somebody else said, oh, I got a threepence, I got a sixpence. That's what they did, they put money in the thing. So I, I ended up with a threepence. And uh, so then after the ship got out of dye dock, well then we went back to New Caledonia, got in our replacements, and uh, then back up to Guadalcanal, to, a little more training, then went up to New Georgia. And now uh, the airstrip Munda was on New Georgia. Well, in the meantime, I got a letter from my brother. And I didn't know he was in the service at the time until I got this letter from him and said he was in the in Army Engineers, 181st Engineers. So I got a letter from him and said they speak French on the island where he was. I said, well, he's either got to be here in New Caledonia or up in the Everdees. And somebody said, uh, I think I remember seeing that sign. So. I got to go into Numea and uh, the town there, and uh, I got right on over the truck uh, cab. I, I told the driver, now if I pound on the cab, stop. Well, he didn't let me off. Okay. So we're going down. There I was, 181st engineer. So I pounded, he left me off, and I started walking up the road. Three trucks were coming down. Pretty soon one slammed on his brakes, and there my brother was driving one of them. So we were together there for a while until I shoved off. He came out one time, and we were gone. And I figured he must have been on Monday, too, because engineers are army. But after the war, we got together, and yes, he had been on Monday. Now, we were on the northern side of New Georgia, and a guy in Barocco knocking out their supply bases up there. And uh, so that's where we, and they had 10,000 Japs on Kola Magara, which we could see. They could see us right across the bay. It's where John Kennedy was with his PT boat mm -hmm. right in that area. And we had landed down at Rice Anchorage at night on the 4th of July, and we'd come two days through the jungles, three days through a swamp to come in behind the jazz. We just never figured anybody come that way. That's what our outfit was known. Show us something that can't be done, and we do it. And uh, so then we, we took the eye of the inner guy, the outpost there, and we, we never really did take Barocco, but oh, they were dug in, dug in, and everything. And in the meantime, the engineers were building a road from Munda over. And uh, one day we sent a patrol down, some guy got killed. And the next day the army came walking in and they were gone. We knew they were doing something. They were doing a lot of pounding and everything, and they were evacuating and going over to Colum And uh, And we used to... And 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 Washington seen Charlie, he was on Guadalcanal too. He's one of these little old things that come over and drop a bomb just to harass you, you know. Mm -hmm. Well, where, what we would do, we would go down where we had landed. We would stand up in the Higgins boat and get supplies and then stay down to come back. So they figured we were still there. And they'd come over and bomb down there, nobody there, you know, so we out far. And uh, but if they had known that all we had was about two battalions. They had 10,000 of them over there. They could, mm -hmm. could come over and wiped us out. Mm -hmm. And there were so many times that it was like on Guadalcanal, if the Japs had waited on the Teneru and Matanacau and the ridge and attacked all at once, there's no way we could have defended it. But it was just, and we found out later that their army and navy didn't get along too well. And uh, so it was just too stupid things on their part that, that, that we survived. In fact, it was so bad there on Guadalcanal that Van de Griff was told to surrender. He never told us so. <laughs> so we never knew. Now, by New Georgia, you had the camouflage uniforms then? No, at New Georgia, we had the camouflage up, but it didn't do any good by the time we got through the swamps. They were all mud. Uh -huh. you know, so. uh -huh. and, uh, now, I had read that uh, some of the units were given a, a flannel belly 
pack or strip like? Did you ever get a band, they called it? Did you ever get one of those? No. Okay, I was just curious. I, I'd read once where some of the units received these. No. One extra, we had a we had an anti-tank gun when we went in there. Some of the guys uh -huh. carried an anti-tank gun, and uh, and that was the biggest weapon we had uh -huh. outside of our 60 millimeter mortars. And uh, so we just, you know, they, they, there's no way we could have got 81s through uh -huh. those jungles yeah. and swamps. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Did you ever? Um, I noticed you said you picked up jungle rat. Did you ever pick up any fevers or anything like that? While uh, you <clears throat> well. A lot of guys got malaria on Guadalcanal. I never got malaria. Huh. And my brother was out there three years. He never got malaria. I don't know why. What about dengue fever? Not dengue fever. I had what they called cat fever. I don't know. I did that. Got that a couple. It was just no. I don't know. Just was that know. the same as what they call cat scratch fever, or is that something different? I don't know. Katara or something like that. And uh, uh, of course, I had a jungle rot, and on, on the Georgia, I had yellow jaundice too. Uh -huh. Not hepatitis, uh -huh. but yellow jaundice, which was di dietary deficiencies. And uh, so, you know, your eyeballs turn yellow. And <laughs> were you hospitalized? No. With it? No? No, because we were leaving the island of Bedak, New Caledonia, and there was a list coming out to come back to the States. And no way was I going to be in sick bay when that list came out. Mm -hmm. So I found out what they did for it. All they did was feed them ice cream and candy and sweet stuff. And so I got as much enforced. Force myself to eat, and uh, by the time I got back to the States, it was... Now, you mentioned here a story about someone, uh, Jinx Powers, oh, a little uh, episode on New Cal yeah, New, New, uh, Cal Georgia. New Georgia, yeah. And uh, he, uh, he got wounded when before we took in a guy. He got wounded, and uh, they, he, he could walk, so they sent him back. Now, go back and, you know, to get, get help, get yourself mm -hmm. treated. And tell him we need help out here. You know, Stu Polonis was one of them. And he said, uh, okay, well, they didn't hear from Jinx. And Jinx went the wrong way. <laughs> Got in into where the Japs were. So he said, well, they timed trees. So he climbed a tree. Got up in the top of a tree. And I guess he spent the night there. And then some of these guys, our guys, went out looking for Jinx. And... Uh, and he heard them coming, but he says, now if I yell at them, they're probably going to shoot me. So he started to sing Mamie Riley, <laughs> song, which was a song that our guys used to sing. And he well, there's Jinx, let's go get him. <laughs> and uh, so he did. And uh, oh, it was something else on Tulagi when uh, I told you there was a, a, used to be a Reveille Joe, a, a Japanese destroyer, used to come up and down. And shell one way Cal over to Cal Guadalcanal and a few our way. Well, it would usually be about five, six o'clock in the morning. Well, the general on the island, he would come down and go into a cave right near where we had our mortar set up to protect the beach. Well, there's one fellow of ours, Andy Doby. He came off duty and he went in this cave and he set up a, a bunch of tin cans and wires and everything else. You know, if somebody came in, it stumbled and wake him up. Well, then come down this general entourage, you know, and stumbled right into that. Oh, Jesus. <laughs> they were mad. They read him up and down and everything and sent him over to, to uh, Colonel Edson. And I'm sure Colonel Edson didn't get along with his general anyway. And I'm sure it was all Edson could do was to keep from laughing right in the general's face. And then he then he congratulated Andy on his <laughs> ingenuity. <laughs> and uh, oh, another thing there on Tulagi, uh, uh, see, we, we don't have uh, chaplains either. Navy supplies chaplains. The Navy used, chaplain used to come around. He says, you know, I like to start rumors. He says, by the time they get back to me, they're really good. You know. <laughs> and then another time he came around, he says, now. After the war, he came from Chicago. He said, after the war, I'm going to get about 50 raiders and paratroopers, and I'm going to win and clean out the underworld of Chicago. <laughs> and, uh, so anyway, then we, we finally left New Georgia and back to New Caledonia, and when I came back to the States, and I was stationed down at Camp Elliott. And, uh, see, and I said, I'd, I'd been in, the, in college, and I got over there, I said, hey, that college bit wasn't so bad after all, you know. <laughs> And I'd heard that they were, had this V-12 program. I don't know if you knew anything about mm -hmm. that or not. It was a Navy 
and where they, they would send high school kids, graduates, to, to college for eight semesters, then send them to midshipman school. And they had a section for the Marine Corps, too. And the Marines would go for four semesters, then go to Quantico for OCS. So when they come back, they gave us two choices. What do you want to do? And I said, well, I'd like to get into that, V-12. He says, well, why don't you wait till you come back? He says, give me the other two, and this will give you three choices. And he says, so I had guard duty as one. So I got guard duty on Camp Elliott in the main gate and then applied through my commanding officer for the V-12 program. And I, I got it. And uh, so in July of 44, I was sent to Denison University, which was not too far from my home in Ohio. And, uh, but after one semester, they did away with the, with the Marine unit there and shipped us up to Oberlin College in Ohio. And so in the fourth semester, the war ended. So they said, oh, you got to go eight semesters now before you go to Quantico. So I was going to go back to general duty and the commanding officer said, well, why don't you take another semester? So I took another semester. My enlistment was up in January, so I extended until March, and I got out. And then I went back to Oberlin as a, as a civilian and eventually finished up. And um, I don't know if you are aware of what kind of school Oberlin College is or not. You know, it's one of the top liberal arts colleges in the country. They wouldn't have even looked at me because I didn't even have any high school, college prep, prep, preparatory courses in high school. I uh -huh. took industrial arts in high school. and uh, But I did well enough while I was there that they let me come back. And the, the coaches, see what they wanted because I played football, basketball, and baseball too. So, and uh, But eventually, you know, normally it takes about 120, 125 hours to get a bachelor's degree. Well. Uh -huh. I had 165 hours by the time I got mine with making up all the deficiencies and everything. And uh, so then I went right out of college. I was 26 by the time. I got married a month after we graduated. And right into a college job, teaching, teaching and coaching job. What was then Patterson State, which is now William Patterson College. And I taught there a couple of years. Well, then, then the Korean Command. And I was in the reserve, so they called me back in. So I, Spent a year down in Portsmouth, Virginia in special service. When I went back in, they gave me the same MOS that I had when I was in before, you know, 60 millimeter mortar. And some sergeant, he, picked, he says, ah, oh, this isn't right. You've got a degree, you've got to teach. So he sent me over to an officer, and they gave me a special service secondary. And that's what I got into, special services. Now, what rank were you at that point? I was corporal. Then. <laughs> See, all the time I was in the, in the V-12, all, all, all ranks were frozen. Everybody reverted back to privates, even though on your record you were still. See, I made PFC after Guadalcanal. Mm -hmm. And uh, in the record book, I was still a PFC, but all the time I was in there, everybody was like a private. So then when I went to get dis discharged, well, if you'd been in rank a number, enough, enough time, they'd get promoted. So that's when I got promoted to corporal when I got discharged. So when he called me back in, and... Uh, but I couldn't get commissioned because I was too old. The cutoff date was 20, 26, and I was 27. But uh, then I made sergeant, and that, that was all right. I mean, I had a pretty good deal. I was player coach of the basketball team, and did the Post newspaper, and a few things like this. And then after a year, I, 13 months, and I got went back to my Patterson job, and, and, and then up to Bates College for three years. And then out to Dome College in Crete, Nebraska for five years. And then YMCA work in Pennsylvania for two years. And then this job up here at Adirondack. The school was one year old when I came up here and I set up all the phys ed, intramurals, athletics and stuff. Now did you ever, uh, I know you got your education while you're in, but did you ever make use of the GI Bill? Oh yes, yes, yes. I went eight summers. I got my master's degree, and uh -huh. I got a 30-hour certificate beyond my master's uh -huh. degree. Okay. To call an education, a specialist in education. Uh -huh. all uh, the, I got all those at NYU. Uh -huh. Did you uh, join any veterans organizations? Oh, yeah. Yes, I've, uh, I still belong. I've got life membership in the Legion. i got life membership in the Marine Corps League. And uh, I, I held officers. Yeah, there's a pass. Commandant of, of the detachment. I was a commandant there for a couple of years. Past president of our Edson's Association. And, uh, so you stayed in contact with 
Oh yeah. People yeah. that served with you. I'm not active now that. because I've had a couple of uh, what do you call it, blood clots in my lungs, you yeah. know, and so I said, well, I, I can't go to meetings without piping off, you know, and expressing myself. So, <laughs> so I just uh, sit back now. Well, I say, right. 82 years old, I guess it's time to relax a little bit. And, and, uh, and this button, people ask me about that. I don't know, see what it is? Heisman. Oh, Heisman. Heisman Club. Uh, Johnny Heisman, his first teaching, coaching job was at Oberlin College. Uh -huh. He was Oberlin's first football coach. And so now they have a club, Oberlin, uh, and they're the club that determines who goes into their athletic hall of fame. And so I'm a member of that, and I'm, so I'm a member of the Heisman, Heisman Club. Yeah. And, uh, how do you think your time in the service changed or had an effect on your life? Oh, I, I uh, well, I go back when I was home once one weekend. I had a picture taken, you know, uh -huh. and when I came back from overseas, it was very solemn, you know. <coughs> when I came back from overseas, I had another picture taken, I had a nice smile and everything, and I told my mother, "I get rid of it." Now. And she says, "No, that's the way you were then. This is the way you are now." So. It, it, uh, well, it, it, as I say, it developed leadership. Uh -huh. my, my leadership much, much better, you know, and I uh, became a leader, I think. Okay, could you tell us, uh, if you hold this up like this, Wayne can focus on it, and yeah. tell us a little bit about where and when that was taken, and... All right, this was my, uh, my squad, my 60 millimeter mortar squad on Guadalcanal, taken in September 1942. Now, you go across the top, uh, I think over here, this was John, John Burke, in the middle was uh, Nadeau, and uh, Pat Reith was the one over here, Eddie Rakowski is down here, and I'm over here, the gunner, or uh, the assistant gunner, he was a gunner and I was assisting him. This is what was left of a, a nine-man squad, and right now, Arnold Nadeau and I are the only two left. Uh, the rest of them. Where and when was that taken? It, it was taken on Guadalcanal in September of 1942. Okay. See the coconut grove in the background? Uh -huh, uh -huh. And, uh, so. and I don't know where the squad leader was. He must have been in sick bay, I guess. A lot of guys in sick bay with uh, malaria or uh, diarrhea and stuff like uh -huh. that. So he must have first squad leader I had got hit the first day on Tulagi, and, uh, and uh, our gunner got hit, and so Nowkowski moved up to gunner, and I moved up to assistant gunner, and another corporal took over the squad, and I don't know what, what happened to him, and I, I, I don't know what happened to him after the war either, uh -huh. and uh, in fact, and on, when, it, when we'd come off Guadalcanal, we were, on New Cal we were in New Caledonia sitting around talking what we were going to do after the war. Well, there was these two corporals, and the guy who was our squad leader, uh, and another corporal. And uh, so we were talking, and I said, well, I'm going to go back to college and play ball. And he said, ah, the kids will run circles around you. Well, they didn't. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so, uh, you know, I, so I wrote to this one corporal that I found his address. He was down in Florida. And I told I started out, you were wrong. <laughs> and then I told him what I had done in college. Uh -huh. Played football all Ohio four years, captain the basketball team, led the baseball team, hitting all this kind of stuff, and got involved. With it. And he no sooner got that than he called me on the phone. He says, that made my day, he said. <laughs> and uh, so, and, uh, and as I say, we still get together every year down in Quantico. We used to go down in Fe uh, February. But after two years of snowstorms in Quantico, because the reason they got together in February, because that was when they actually started to form. Uh -huh. Well, then they went to April when they went overseas. So it's much better going down uh -huh. in April now. I imagine. And, uh, and we, as I say, we, last time I think there were about 25 of us there. We lose 15, 20 guys every year. Uh -huh. However, we have over 100 at our uh, big dinner on Saturday night because we have sons, daughters, grandsons, granddaughters, 
and recently, the last five years or so, we've been getting nieces and nephews and younger brothers and sisters of fellows who got killed. Ah. They want to come and find out. Mm -hmm. You know, and uh, in fact, there's a fellow, his brother was six months older than I am, was, and he went in the same, from Indiana, he went in the same Marine Corps same day I did, got to boot camp at the same time, he was in platoon 69, I was in platoon 66, we went up to Quantico together, the right fire to right range, into the Raiders were together, he went in B Company, I went in E Company, he got killed first day at school, first day, and so his younger brother has been coming the last few years, and not just last year, but the year before, he got to talk to a fellow who was right beside his brother when he got killed. Uh -huh. So he, he's been getting a lot of closure, uh -huh. and uh, that's a, that's the type of. So we've been getting people like that coming, and we always have some kind of a general come and talk. And, uh -huh. In fact, a lot of things that we instigated, the Marine Corps still uses the team, uh, fire teams. We we were the first ones to use the fire teams. You know, on a squad, there used to be two BARs to a squad. Well, they made three fire teams in each squad, and each squad, each fire team had a BAR, so that gave us a lot more firepower. And uh, so we were one of the, and we, we, of course, we were the leaders in all these rubber boat, you know, amphibious landings and all that kind of stuff. And, uh, but it was just, uh, I don't know, they say, you know, of course, once a Marine, always a Marine. But, and uh, the, the Raiders, we, we were just, Something different, you know, uh -huh. and uh, so. Um, oh, anything else you want to? Uh, yes, that's it. Okay. Well, thank you very much. Thank you. Um, can we? Kind of